Um, so my name is Gajinder Panisar. Everyone calls me Gaj, and uh, I'm the CTO of Ultrasoc. So my, the title of my talk is, it's not about the core, it's about the system. Um, and hopefully as I go through the presentation, you'll see what I mean. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I'll give you an overview of what I'm attempting to talk about, and then I'll give you an example of what Ultrasoc does uh, the architectural overview, followed by some uh, example scenarios, and then I'll touch on some work that we're doing at the moment to do with in-field analysis, which is gaining a lot of traction with our customers. Uh, there's some ML thrown in there because it's quite fashionable. And then we'll follow up with a summary, and then I'll give you an outline of what the demos are. So let's get on with it. So, you know, in, in complex systems, Understanding behavior is not easy. You know, surprisingly, systems don't work or don't behave as you expected. It comes as a surprise, but it does happen. And now, this may be due to a number of factors from not understanding how process-to-process -process, uh, interaction should happen, prof uh, peripheral interaction, real-time events, or you've badly timed how DMA should transfer one block to another, hence you miss a slot in LTE. And, you know, hiring software engineers is not always an option. And top tip, don't tell VP of engineering to hire soft better software engineers. It doesn't go down very well. I tried it once. It didn't work. Okay. And, oh, by the way, hardware engineers are also prone to introducing bugs. They're not immune. Providing visibility of an SOC behavior is very important. And you'll see, as I go through this slide deck, that what I mean. So providing visibility needs to be done in an intelligent manner, not in a dumb manner where you're swamping the system with ma large amounts of data, but in an intelli intelligent manner. And be, be careful, the core is a very small part of the system. In an SOC, there's shed loads more stuff that does more than the core. Right, some obvious statements. SOCs have become increasingly complicated. Now, that's no surprise to many of you. Now, these SOCs contain several, in some cases, thousands of processors, and they may be from different vendors. You know, pick your favorite one, incumbent today, and risk fives these days. The SOCs will contain hundreds of SIPs, silicon IP blocks. They will invariably contain different kinds of interconnects, be it NOCs, be it conventional interconnects, or interconnects designed in-house. There'll be software designed and implemented by teams across the world. They don't all necessarily talk on a day-to-day -day basis, but this software is gonna be huge. And all this stuff has to work together. It has to work together, otherwise there's no point in producing something. So, you know, debugging such a system isn't just about run control. It's not about just what's running on the core. It's more than just CPU-centric information such as in instruction trays. Now, don't get me wrong, these things are important, but these are only small parts of the problem. Now, in order for RISC-V to be successful, it has to coexist in systems where there are thousands of processors, where there are interconnects, there are different kinds of uh, silicon IP blocks, and has to support large amounts of software. It has to coexist in that environment, otherwise it won't be successful. You can't have small, isolated systems. So the key requirements of such a debug and monitoring system are as follows. It's one that enables access to proprietary debug schemes used by other cores. So remember, we're talking about heterogeneous systems. You know, the whole world doesn't rotate around RISC-V, not at least yet. We need to have monitors that observe transactions on interconnects, knocks, interfaces, custom logic, and these monitors need to be runtime configurable. There's no point in laying down hardware blocks that just do one function only once. You want to make use of that silicon area that you've laid down in an intelligent manner to be able to observe and react to, to different scenarios. You need to be able to have cross-triggering between these modules, i.e. you need to be able to have one module saying, now do something else to another part of the chip. 
And this cross-triggering, you need to have more than just a handful. As systems get more and more complicated, more complex systems, that uh, runtime uh, cross-triggering is very key. And they need to be, these modules need to be interrogated at runtime, so when systems go wrong, there has enough information in them that you can pull out state. It needs to be power aware, so you can turn things off. You need to be able to gate things. There needs to be a security system architecture built in. What I mean by that is you don't want your debugger monitoring system to be a backdoor into your uh, SOC and thereby bringing down the environment that you're in. But key to this, you need to be able to have this monitoring and system right from, from simulation to FPGAs, to emulation, and in final SOCs in, in field. And that's important and becoming more and more uh, attractive as systems become more complex. So my CEO insists I put this slide in. This is a corporate slide. I, I promise this is the last one I'm going to put in. The company is Ultrasoc. It was founded in 2009. <coughs> We're a VC-funded company based in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, we also have an office in Bristol in the UK. We closed a round last year of $7 million, and with that, we acquired a, a well-known gentleman called Alberto San Giovanni Vincitelli, who may, some of you may know. Um, we have a, you know, a reasonably large number of patents that go with this. And, you know, we're a small company, we have about 32 employees, and that's mostly engineering. There is some overhead, like CTOs, but most of them are engineering. Um, we have, a, you know, when we're real, we have customers who deploy our stuff, and then the top half, if I can work out, if I can pass the IQ test how this works, well, maybe I can't. Uh, so this half of the screen is, shows some of our customers who are happy for us to put our slides up, uh, put their names up, albeit some of them want them in a brown box. So we've got some reasonable players who, who use our IP. And the bottom half here are some of our partners. Some partners are customers and vice versa, but we're not just a silicon company. We provide tools too. So going to give you an architecture overview of what we do, and then I'll delve into how we use this and why it's, how it become, become useful to you guys. So a high-level diagram of an SOC. So this is a typical SOC. It has an interconnect. It could be a NOC, could be a conventional interconnect, but de facto standards or in-house. And in a, in a real system, there'll be heterogeneous CPU cores, not just totally risk wise albeit there are some startups that just, just do that, but in today, real systems will be heterogeneous. There'll be DSPs, DRAM controllers, bunch of peripherals, GPUs maybe, or even, you know, CNN, CNN accelerators. So that's a typical SOC, high level, but there it is. So what Ultrasoc provides is three classes of IP. The first class we call analytics modules. And we have CPU-centric analytics modules called PAMs, processor analytic modules. We have things called trace receivers to receive uh, trace coming out of ARM cores, MIP cores, ARC cores. But we also have uh, our own trace encoder for the RISC-V uh, cores. This is uh, something uh, where, where, where pushing through the, the, the RISC-V foundation. So uh, Ultrasoc is heading the uh, processor trace task group. Uh, we're also part of the active in the debug task group. So these analytics modules help observing and interacting with cores. Our second class of IP blocks go to make up what we call a message passing infrastructure. This message passing infrastructure moves any data to and from these process analytics modules. As you can see, these message fabric elements are totally uh, orthogonal to the target interconnect. So that, that way, there is no perturbation of the target system. And then there's some way of getting 
two on off the Ultrasoc uh, monitoring system. In this case, I'm showing a JTAG communicator. It's called a communicator because it's communicating with the Ultrasoc world to another world. In this case, the other world happens to be the JTAG to the outside world. So this, this here, this subsystem is your classic run control. This is what most people think debugging is. This is debugging code running on a processor, which is great. You need that. Actually, it's quite boring to me. It's, this is just getting your code up and running. But more importantly, what we provide as part of our three classes of IP are things like bus monitors. Now, these bus monitors are not dumb. They're protocol aware and transaction aware. And at runtime, you can configure them to provide s visibility of certain things like transactions from a particular master or the end outstanding transaction to a slave or the transaction time it takes to complete the latency of uh, putting it onto the bus, and so on. You can provide, it does min, max averages, counters, window timing. I'll give you some examples shortly. But the, the concept here is not to generate cycle by cycle redundant information. It's to generate smart information. And then we have other ways of communicating to the Ultrasoft world. We have what's called a USB communicator. This does USB uh, protocol and uh, buffering completely in hardware. There's no processor involved at all. So from time zero, you plug a USB cable in, you're ready to go. You don't need to bring bootstrap any code. It's done completely in hardware. And in fact, I'll demo that this evening. We have something called an AXI communicator. Uh, it c it this is becoming more and, more and more important when I come to the, and I, I'll explain that in the final examples I'll come to, so on-chip analysis in the field. And then we have a way of streaming stuff into memory, a uh, system memory which can be deployed for a period of time to suck data off at some other time. So either the system itself can uh, work on this data or a uh, debug entity off-chip can handle it. And then we have a bunch of other analytics modules, such as static instrumentation, DMA engines, and status monitor. The status monitor is quite is important too. It's like an embedded logic analyzer. It provides trace capture metrics. It pr provides counting. And more importantly, it has an eight-stage sequencer. So you can do if-then-else type scenarios. So what you have before you is two systems in one. You have your classic SOC, which is what you all design or want to have to work, and then you have an orthogonal monitoring system. Now, the amount of, orthog amount of monitoring you put in is certainly system dependent. For certain low, low complex systems, you don't want much in the way of blocks, but high, for example, servers and automotive, you want as much visibility as you can get. So the target system doesn't know it's being monitored. The monitoring system doesn't perturb the target system unless you design it to do so. So for example, the run control is clearly uh, affects the behavior of the target system. But in life, in-field monitoring is totally non-intrusive. Not, so, not just hardware, we provide a bunch of tools too. And so on the left-hand side, you will see uh, uh, Eclipse-based IDE. So it has the classic view. You know, this is usually in, in the lab or bring up. So here you have your, your, your classic source level debug. Here, this is, in fact, a RISC-V uh, trace being decoded uh, from our RISC-V uh, encoder. Uh, here, you, you've got the trace packets being displayed. But more importantly, what we've got here is visibility of the SOC. There's a bunch of monitors, the, the, status mo uh, the bus monitors observing transactions to and from uh, various masters and slaves being displayed here. So this is fine for in, uh, in lab and bring up. It makes software engineers feel great because they can look at their software, get it running, brilliant. But actually in the field, you want to observe what's going on when things go wrong. And you don't necessarily need all this rubbish here. So what you need is stuff that will configure your blocks and extract the information that you need. And so we provide a, a, a scripting way, a method. So you can 
just configure your, the particular blocks that you're interested in, configure them to look at the certain scenarios, and the data comes off, and how you display it will clearly be system dependent. So we have these two approaches. Great, so that's what we do. We provide a monitoring system that lets you observe what's happening. I'm not gonna touch on um, run control because that's fairly obvious. You start and stop processes, you look at code, set breakpoints, run, go and set some more breakpoints, look at instruction trace. But what I'm gonna hope give you some examples of is SOC visibility and how you can use the monitors to give you some interesting information to help debug and provide visibility and uh, insight in how the system's behaving. So let's take this example as, as a typical SOC. This happens to be uh, a software-defined radio. Uh, it's pretty long in the tooth because it only has two scalar processors, but it has you know, three DSPs, some interconnect, a uh, set of interconnects, some peripherals, DRAM controller. And so these blocks here, this color blocks are ultrasoft blocks. What I've done is I've collapsed the, the message passing infrastructure into one block, but there'll be several segments of those throughout the SOC. And the debug hub here is our USB hub, uh, which is completely handles USB in hardware and also provides a hub function. So this happens to have, the SOC happens to have a, a USB as well. But in this case, the, the, the software on the host will see two devices, one US, uh, ultrasoft, one target system. So with such a system in place, we can ask questions like, why is, why is my CPU not giving the performance that I need? Why do my DMAs take uh, so long to complete? What's going in my memory controller? Why is there a mismatch between my DSPs? Or why do I get deadlock? Now, whilst this is a software-defined radio, the functions are the same. You've got compute, you've got different kinds of compute, you've got data, you've got data flow, you've got interconnects. So, you know, whilst the application is different, the underlying fundamentals are the same. So this is applicable to a server market or the automotive market, as well as a handset or a base station market. Okay, let's give you some real examples. So in this picture, this bus monitor here is attached to a dual port DRAM controller. The system software is running on this SOC at wire speed. I'm not running the system any lower than it should do normally. So in this case, what I've got, to, I'm configuring this bus monitor to look at transactions coming out of the iCache port of that scalar processor. Excuse me. I'm using iCache because you guys know if you miss on iCache, you stall, so therefore you're losing performance. So the bus monitor here is counting the number of transactions from the iCache port in a window of time. When that window of time expires, it sends that count off and then starts again. So the amount of data being generated by that uh, monitor is minuscule. But what it means is that you can, over time, you can plot this pie chart. And this pie chart gives some interesting information. 80% of the time, there are no iCache I misses, means that the processor is maxing out. It's available for compute. 8% of the time, you see two outstanding iCache misses. And 12% of the time, you see one outstanding iCache miss. Now, it tells me 8% of the time, the branch predictor on that processor is mispredicting. And that means you can get the compiler writer guys and indeed the software guys to provide better hints to claw back that 8%. Now remember this, is, this information is collected at runtime, at wire speed. So in fact you can experiment with placement of code to reduce that 12% too. So you can experiment with placement of code, see how that affects your single iCache misses and then you try and reduce that 12% to much less, and then you can compare the software release you're doing today with the software release you did last week or the week before or whenever it was. So you could use this as a QA mechanism as well as a, a debugging and monitoring mechanism. Another example is, remember this is a software-defined radio, and in this case I'm looking at four processors, two scalar processors and two DSPs. I'm looking at the iCache ports. This time I'm getting that same bus monitor, reconfiguring the same hardware, reconfiguring it, but this time do min-max average 
calculations of the bandwidth going to that DRAM, con DRAM controller in a window of time. Over a long window of time, the average from those four, DS four processors, the average is about 600 megabytes. But in that window of time, there is, in this window of time here, all the iCache misses ha arrive at the same time to that DRAM controller. In this case, we're seeing two megabytes of traffic going to that DRAM controller. Now, this is just iCache misses. It's got nothing to do with the, the data uh, accesses or DMA or indeed the turbo. In the category 12 LTE modem, you're talking three gigabytes worth of traffic. So, you know, you're clearly pushing the limits of the DRAM controller if that happens with the same at the same time as the turbo. Now, clearly, if this happens very often and that window is quite large, then you have a serious problem. And this will highlight when this happens because you have the time when it happened and you know the masters in involved. The same bus monitors can be reconfigured at runtime to look for things like deadlock. Now, in this case, my definition of deadlock, a request goes out and a, re a response never or takes a very long time to come back. You, at runtime, you can configure the, the bus monitor to say, this is the amount of time that you need to wait before you can report there's a deadlock or should wait before you uh, report there's a deadlock. You can configure the bus monitors to take copies of transactions going by and putting them in a circular buffer inside the monitor itself. And so when the deadlock does happen, you have everything that led up to that deadlock. It doesn't solve the problem, but it gives you enough visibility to help solve that problem. Another example, this is, happens quite a lot in things like base stations, even though the manufacturers of base stations say it doesn't. And same thing in, in handsets, your system freezes, you know, your handset freezes. What do you do? So if you have these monitors at key places, DRAM controller being one, the D, uh, turbo another, your various CPUs, and they run continuously running, taking transactions, putting them in circular buffers. And when it, the, the monitors observe that the systems hang, they can either write the data to memory or preserve the data until some point there is a request to extract that information. Now this information could be seen as a system-wide core dump which will help provide insight into why the system hung. So th those are bus monitor type applications. In this case, I'm looking at, in this example, I'm looking at this status monitor here. This is observing the, the PMU signals. In this case, this is an arm. The PMU signals of, of the processor. I'm configuring the status monitor to look at all the stall signals. You can choose at runtime which stall signals or what signals you want to look at. But at runtime, I'm configuring to look at stall signals, uh, count the number of stall signals at runtime in a window of time, send that, uh, the count off across our message pass infrastructure and then off chip. So it's a count per window of time. And what this means is that you can plot a bar chart live as the system's running. Uh, you have the timestamp, then you also know you can observe how the stall behavior is happening. You can s clearly, you guys know, more the, 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 the bar charts go high and more often you're starting to get serious problems because the system's stalling. And then you can reconfigure as the system's running to just look at, say, the uh, data stalls or just the instruction stalls. And that way you can observe what is causing the stall. In this example, I'm going to show you uh, cross-triggering. Um, this is for a particular customer where they have ARM and RISC-V cores running in the same system. And they want to have the facility, the, the feature, that they only want to observe trace when certain conditions occur. And in this particular case, uh, the condition is uh, processor A, ARM processor A stalls, and they want to observe processor B trace and RISC-V trace and so what, this, what we do is we configure this bus monitor to look at transactions to the region of memory that causes processor A to stall. So when processor A sees transactions from a non-CPU peripheral, a, a DMA or a hardware accelerator in this case, it cross sends a cross-trigger message to our status monitor here 
this state of the monitor observing the stall signal of that processor. When that sees a stall signal, it sends a cross-triggering message to the trace receiver of this arm and our trace encoder here to say, now start capturing trace. You guys know this. What this means is instead of having shed loads of trace coming out, mostly irrelevant, you only get the trace for the region that you're interested in. So this way you can manage the amount of data that is actually transported off chip and also on chip to intel intelligently just look at the areas that you're interested in. So examples of instrumented code, some, some small systems don't want the overhead of all these other monitors. So you can have something called a static instrumentation block, this one here. And so what this does, it provides N uh, RTL parameterizable N mailboxes, which can be written to at runtime. So you do posted writes, both in, so you can do it via software. So, you know, Linux is of this world or real RTOS, uh, free RTOSs already have those macros. And indeed hardware, you can have hardware that can do posted writes, especially things like turbo encoders because you will have specific uh, DMA engines inside them. And what this would mean, things are time-stamped, you know who, who sent the posted write, and then what you can do over time is plot something like this. This is a simple XL, XL plot. Uh, so, you know, it shows how much time was spent. So you would send a, 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 a static instrumentation right here, a static instrumentation right here, the DMA does one here. And so from this, you can determine how long the I service routine took, how long the DMAs tech took, uh, FFTs and a turbo, oh, and then the turbo gens a static instrumentation right, which then causes a cross-triggering. So this is a simple way of visualizing it, but we have, as I mentioned, we have partners. In this case, we have a, a, company, a partnership with a company called Persepio, who take this information and then they can observe it in their, their tool, which is quite a you know, very nice looking tool for the, I, I don't have a slide for it because of the time short, so there are a number of ways of visualizing what's going inside your SOC. So I mentioned in-field is becoming very important. And so if you remember right at the beginning, I showed something called an AXI communicator. What that enables is the traffic, instead of the configuration and the data that these monitors generate, instead of flowing off chip, they can go on chip to an on chip uh, uh, analytics engine. And this is something we, we've been uh, working with uh, over the last year or so, and I'm just going to share some, some, some results. And we have customers who are going to be deploying this in uh, safety critical systems such as automotive. But I think that there, there are applications in things like servers as well. Uh, so let me run through them. So this picture captures uh, encapsulates more or less what Ultrasoft provides. So there's raw data. So this is what the data collected, or generated in the SSC world. And then what we do with our monitors, we take that data and provide information, such as uh, the, the latency it took to do this transaction, or the CPU stalled here, or these things happened when. But what we're doing now is moving that up to something, a knowledge-based system. So, you know, here is the sort of raw data collection. This is providing some, some information, as in the bandwidths that the bus monitors are seeing. But what we're doing now is, is taking that data and providing some software on top of it to do automatic analysis. So here's an example of one. This isn't the software-defined software radio. It's, it's a, a simple system with three processors, a DMA engine, a display, um, and so on. And what we're doing here is we've got bus monitors looking at transactions coming out of these uh, uh, masters. And, taking, and the bus monitors themselves at runtime are calculating the latency for these transactions. And they were cross-correlating that with the bandwidth that various things see. And this, the, the, M, the, the runtime system can then generate the data to plot this heat map. And you can see that things like the DMA engines are actually affecting the behavior of the CPUs. 
because they're delaying transactions coming out of the CPUs. Now, in a small system, you could argue this is fairly easy to, 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 to work out on the back of an envelope. But think about a system where you've got 32 or 1,000 processors or 4,000 processors in the case of Esperanto. This, this would be very, very useful to do. And this is uh, showing anomaly, latency anomaly of, of iCache misses. The, 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 the analytic software running on the chip is looking at the latency of the, uh, of the iCache misses. And there's a, a statistical, in this case, a statistical anomaly detection. And it can highlight in red the, the, the uh, anomalous behavior that it's seeing. Now, non-intrusive profiling. Now, this is, this is very important because profiling actually, co conventional modern day profiling actually consumes resources. It actually affects the behavior of your system. You suffer from Heisenberg's principle. And so what we're doing here is we're sampling the, the uh, time taken by the processes running on each core. And we're doing this by the sideband signals of an AXI. Uh, protocol and the system this is doing this non-intrusively and the system can highlight the anomalous behavior in this case anomalous means it's taking too long but clearly you can see this this becomes a signature of the behavior of the system so you can provide higher level uh, analyst, analytic software to do this and finally here this is we were asked by a customer to to look at whether we could detect stuck pixels coming out of a camera before it went to the stack running on the application processor. And so what we have here is this is the image going into, coming out of the, the, the camera. And here, this is our software that's detected. So the, the software is, is observing transactions coming off the camera, it's a master. And we're seeing the data hasn't changed in this window of time, this window, and this is the stuck pixel. So we're doing it live with that long time before it gets to the application software. And this is, is, is key for things like uh, automotive systems. So summary, uh, system complexity is systemic. There's processor, post, processor, processor interactions, hardware and software interactions, oodles of different kinds of interconnects, long tails dominate, and they're very hard to detect. So Ultrasoft provides a completely scalable, coherent analytics and monitoring system. It's system-wide, non-intrusive, and then runtime analytics and ML help engineers to identify subtle problems efficiently. And the demo this evening, it looks like this. So we have a, a, a hard, a, a zinc platform. So, you know, our customers have real silicon, but we have a FGA platform, has dual core ARM, Risk five with trace encoder, a bunch of our IP blocks. And then what we'll show is an IDE with a bunch of scenarios that I mentioned earlier. So thank you, that's my talk. Yeah, I found it interesting that you can also detect the system freeze. So is it, what, what level do you do it? Because system freeze could have happened because of some kernel hanging or some threads actually contain, uh, containing or something. But you, I thought you really operate at the, more at the core level. So how do you get the context of a system freeze? So it, it's um, implementation specific. So I, I gave one example of how that would work. Uh, uh, so you would have um, bus monitors, status monitors observing behavior of, of, of the system. So if, if the kernel hung, for example, you wouldn't see any transactions coming out from the kernel from the core. So you would know that that would, the monitor could detect so that behavior. The, you observe the delay and then yes. infer that there might be a system yeah. freeze. Yes, and what action is taken when that system free is observed is again runtime configurable and system configurable. So for example, in a, in a, in a process plant, you want to tell the operator that this happened. In a, in, a, in a car, you may want to put the warning light on or put, you, put the car in drive home safe mode. So it, it, what we'd provide is a, a bag of bits that will enable you to have a system for your needs. In the concept of SDR, I'm not sure if you're doing any DBFS here, 
but would you have any way to detect uh, power itself directly? I'm not sure what the temperature graph actually measure the temperatures everywhere. So I, I didn't show temperature I mean, graphs. You there. said power or something. I'm not sure that yeah, is, so is bandwidth translated equivalent power. Sure. Yeah. So, so you can anal analyze the data coming off no. and then do a power analysis on top of that. Correct. What, what I meant, what I the the power b bullet was that the monitors are designed with power aware mm -hmm. in mind. So there's clock gating. There's turn, uh, so you can have power domains where you can turn things off. Mm -hmm. But in terms of of analyzing power, we can provide the data that will give you, uh, so you can run power analysis data on top of that, uh, and a, a software on top of that. We have a partnership with a company called Mortech, who give you, provide PVT monitors, and then we couple that with our monitors in the digital domain, and that will provide further information for... So what, what does it do? It actually measures some diode voltages across the chip to Correct. the temperature? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. So I have a question about, uh, uh, do you need any extra logic on the chip in terms of, say, logic analyzer, buffers, and things like that on the chip? So uh, th there's no free lunch, right? So, so th th these things, if you want, in, in field, they will take gates. Uh, and th the, the, the monitors that I showed you, they, they, they take a certain number of gates. And the amount of buffering that you want per monitor or external to the monitor is RTL parameterizable. So there is a degree of, you know, you can't be like a kid going into a sweet shop or a, or a candy shop. You know, you, you, you could, you know, populate your SOC with lots of monitors everywhere, and then your chip would be about this size. You, you, you need to do a, a sensible analysis of these are the key bits I want to look at, and then tune the monitors specific to that. So, you know, typically our, our customers see less than 1% overhead in using our monitors. If you refer to uh, slide number eight. Hey, okay. yeah. It's so let me... Correct, the, correct. So, so you have two messaging themes in this, uh, the second layer, right? The flexible and scalable message fabric, right? You have two message engines. So in this example it is, but I wouldn't get hung up on the numbers. So it, you're not getting hung up on the numbers, okay. So, so, so in a particular architecture, in this example, you could just get away with one message engine, okay? Because this is just classic run control. As I mentioned, this is what people think about debug being, right? But, but in this example, you could probably get away with just one in this case. But these things aren't, the message engines aren't particularly large. No, 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 it's not frozen. It, it, no, no, so what, what you get, what you would get is you, you would get one of these and you, you, you configure it at RTL time to say, well, I want N ports up and M ports down. Uh, and then from a, an architectural point of view, it may, may, may make sense to have another one because you've got something else. Yeah? It depends where you put them. If, if, if the, the chip is, you know, you want to monitor here and here, you may find that actually it's, it's uh, signal integrity-wise better to have two message engines as opposed to busting a gut to, to lay out time to make that happen. 